Hello, good evening, and welcome to this presentation of the API's Ion Government, a program that keeps you up to date on government's plans, projects, and policies being implemented to promote growth, sustainability, and development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm Hala John. On this evening's program, St. Vincent and the Grenadines plays host to the seventh meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers in Education. We'll bring you highlights from the opening ceremony. On the heels of the fifth anniversary of the AIA, we'll explore the operations of local company SVG Air. Then it's fine dining with Marvin Oliver and the students of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College. And later, seafood stocks are being assessed in a new study. More on these stories will follow Newswatch with the API's Bavin Oliver. Good evening and welcome to News Watch for Thursday, February the 17th, 2022. I am Bath and Oliver. St. Vincent and Grenadines has bolstered its legislative framework under which medicinal cannabis and associated products can be exported. This through St. Vincent and Grenadines Medicinal Cannabis Industry Standard and Compliance Regulations 2022. The legislation, which took a couple of years to be completed, will be gazetted soon. Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable Subota Caesar, says this document puts SVG at the forefront in its quest to export and develop the cannabis industry. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have shown to the rest of the world that we were able to work with industry stakeholders, work with the traditional cultivators, the Rastafari community, to draft a piece of legislation that has attracted significant investment to the country. And uh, in recent times, we witnessed the historic exportation of medicinal cannabis from St. Vincent and the Grenadines to Europe. Dr. Gerald Thompson says the legislation ensures producers have a product which meets international standards and requirements. How can we make what is produced something that the international sector is going to appreciate, is going to want, and is going to desire. Now, in terms of the various methods of production, you need production that can overcome what's called the technical barriers to trade. Because sometimes you can produce a very high quality product and it's an excellent product, but if it's not packaged in the right way, if there isn't the right documentation, if the safety profile is not right, if you haven't had the record keeping and the testing, then it may not be able to make the grade for international trade. The document also allows for farmers to be guided in the standards so that it becomes second nature in their production practices. A more simplified form in which traditional cultivators could also pick up in a stepwise fashion of how they could further improve their quality. So I am very, very proud of this particular document and the ability of this document to be used not just for medicinal cannabis, but for other crops. The culture and heritage of St. Vincent and the Grenadines was displayed in fine style by Vincentian entertainers at Expo Dubai 2020. The cultural showcase saw representation from Gamal Skinny Fabulous Doyle, Chanel McKenzie, Hans John, Rory Luther McIntosh, Rodney Small, Darren Andrews, Sarah Mark, Jomoa Francis, among other performers. Members of the delegation who participated in the cultural exchange expressed pride with their contribution to this segment. Cultural Ambassador and Production Manager Rodney Small says representations were well received by patrons. All our performances were well received, our venues were full to capacity. Um, persons were basically saying that um, they love our energy, they love how we are professional, they love how we are organized. The head of production even said that um, the only other country that they would compare our professionalism with an organization with an um, energy with is with Panama 
Um, there are other patrons who said, you know, mean they, they, it's some of the best performances that they have seen since they were at, at the expo. Our national day was a feature on, you know, mean the volcano, um, um, what happened in the shelter, and there was a young man who was displaced, and he was able to learn so much while being in the shelter. Former Soka Monarch and TNT Road Match winner, cultural ambassador, Gamal Skinny Fabulous Doyle shared his experience as part of the delegation to Expo Dubai 2020. But this is my first time on the, well, on the, this type of mission as a part of a delegation for SVG. My first time at an expo. And just as a visitor, that was pretty amazing to just be in this huge but diverse space called the Expo Village. And it's 192 countries all being represented by booths and pavilions. And you, you walk into somebody's pavilion and then you're, you're kind of seeing a, or getting a slice of their culture, their innovations, their technologies, you know. So, and it was no different for St. Vincent's booth. They, they, you went into St. Vincent's pavilion and then you, you felt immediately a sense of what, what the island is about, the 32 islands and keys. You got a sense of the, the beauty, the, the, the warmth of the people, you know. As the OECS ECCB International Netball Series continues in Dominica, Team SVG continues its winning ways in their quest to be crowned the new champions. The team has so far played three games, winning all three. Having beaten St. Kitts and Nevis, host Dominica and Antigua and Barbuda thus far. The Vinci Ladies has a goal difference of 93 goals, having converted 182 shots with 89 scoring against them. The SVG senior netballers are currently playing Barbados and will match up against St. Lucia tomorrow for their final match in the championship. The St. Vincent and the Grandies national women's soccer team, Lady Heat, suffered a 3-0 defeat at the hands of host Cuba yesterday. Team Lady Heat is partaking in the CONCACAF Women's Qualifiers to see qualifications to the FIFA Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand 2023. The team is set to play their home game against Haiti on Sunday in Cuba, as the COVID restrictions do not allow Vinci Heat to host. The Group E matches will continue in April when Lady Heat come up against BVI and Honduras. And this is me News Watch. I am Bob Nolver. The API's Iron Government continues with Hala John. Welcome back to this presentation of Iron Government by the Agency for Public Information. Education in extraordinary times from vulnerability to resilience is the theme of the seventh meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers in Education currently being hosted in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Earlier today, the opening ceremony was held at the NIS conference room and saw the Minister of Education and Incoming Chair, the Honorable Curtis King, along with local and regional education officials, paving the way for the two days of discussions. We'll learn more in this report. The seventh meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers of Education was held amidst the backdrop of COVID-19, climate change, and the steady progression of digital technology. Host country St. Vincent and the Grenadines officiated the opening ceremony, which saw a number of education officials addressing the ceremony virtually. Minister of Education and incoming chair, the Honorable Curtis King, pointed out that the meeting is being held at a crucial time and urged the ministers and officials to capitalize on the opportunity to build capacity in meeting the current challenges through the advancement of technology. Our meeting will provide a platform for the sub-regions, ministers of education and other stakeholders to reflect and exchange ideas on the current state of our education and to strengthen the regional coordinated response to the challenges facing our education. 
Specifically, the meeting will examine selected key education issues in keeping with the OECS education sector strategy. The meeting will agree to strategies and policies related to advancing education initiatives associated with ongoing implementation of the OECS and response to COVID-19 pandemic. The meeting will also secure the support and collaboration of regional agencies and development partners in advancing education in the OECS. At this meeting, we will share innovative ideas and successful practices that have contributed to educational development at the national level, and finally, and very importantly, at this meeting, we will endorse the OECS Declaration on Education. Finally, our meeting will hear from the next generation of leaders, the youth, two students, one from the secondary schools and another from the primary schools will share their perspectives on the education, on their education, sorry, in these extraordinary times and make recommendations to the ministers on how to address some of these challenges. It is crucial that the people across the sub-region are made aware of our deliberations. For they too are stakeholders in the respective education systems. We therefore look forward to sharing some of the major outcomes from this meeting with members of the media from across the sub-region on Friday 18th February. This will be done in a press briefing immediately following the conclusion of our meeting. Director General of the OECS, Dr. Didicus Jules, also emphasized the importance of resilience in boosting the education system within the region, noting that it is necessary to rethink, reshape, and transform education while reducing adherence to tradition but embracing innovation. The pandemic has exposed the inequities and antiquities in our current education system. And only recently, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez drew attention of the OECS heads of government to what the World Bank has described as the generational catastrophe triggered by the disruption of learning. This pandemic has reminded us that education in the OECS region is severely hampered by traditional notions that do not suit our present day context. Students need to know that they are being educated for the highly technological world that we live in today and for the constantly changing environment they will have to adapt to in the future. What is required to shift from vulnerability to resilience in education? There are several key and urgent challenges. Transformation in and of education is critical and is the only pathway to shift us from vulnerability to resilience. For us at the OECS Commission, this connects with the regional priorities that we have set for this new triennium. Reinventing the economy, building resilience, and advancing equity and inclusion. It is necessary, therefore, for us to rethink reshape and transform education. We need to lessen our adherence to tradition and experiment with fresh models that re explore creativity and reward uniqueness. We need to engage in lateral and design thinking, promote the exception or the extraordinary. Strict adherence to the status quo without reason is a hindrance to true potential. We need to be agile in responding to the evolving threats to our education systems 
likewise changing advancements in technology. It is also necessary to reinforce the need for data to guide the decision-making process. The situation is critically reliant on scientific knowledge production, as well as data to effectively inform our decisions and our overall governance. The region needs a decisive strategic approach to address learning loss among students, the generational catastrophe to which we referred earlier. Technology is at the forefront to help us to begin to close that gap, but there needs to be equitable access to technology in education. Of major concern is the need to change the examination driven culture, which is negatively impacting quality instruction to a more inclusive, relevance, relevant and evidence-based model. And this does not mean doing away with examinations. It simply means making more use of um, formative assessment in addition to summative assessment. And we are working assiduously on concrete proposals for the consideration of ministers, which if agreed, will be forwarded to all relevant partners for action. The Declaration of Education referred to by Minister King signals a new approach to education in the OECS as the region seeks to strengthen its resilience. The OECS Declaration on Education stems from extensive reflection and consultation with stakeholders from across the, end, the region to identify a new pathway to systemic learning duly informed by lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I need to emphasize here that this process of consultation critically involves the voices of students. Pledging the UWI's commitment in providing technical support to the advancement of education through the region. Keynote speaker Vincentian Pro, Vice Chancellor of the UWI, Professor C. Justin Robinson, reiterated the importance of having citizens of the region who can compete in a technological world while having an awareness of issues relating to climate change and non-communicable diseases. As Pro Vice Chancellor, both for undergraduate studies at the UWI, we take a particular interest in developments in the education sector in the Eastern Caribbean, as the Eastern Caribbean member countries continue to be critical stakeholders in the UWI, a major source of students for us and a major market for our graduates. As a national of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I also take a personal interest in the development in education in the Eastern Caribbean. Many of, the, many of the options I have had in life have been as a result of the educational opportunities afforded to me in St. Vincent and at the UWI. And I take a personal interest in, in such opportunities being available for persons across the sub-region. As you meet, we are at a critical point in the education sector in the region as we grapple with the challenges posed by the ongoing, ever-evolving COVID-19 pandemic. At the primary, secondary, and university level, a number of our students have been forced to learn in a primarily online mode. There's been much documented by a range of agencies and researchers about the potential for educational deficits especially among those at the primary and secondary level. And as you deliberate, I'm hoping we, you can find strategies that we can safely reopen schools across the Eastern Caribbean sub-region and continue to provide these educational services in a safe manner so that we don't risk a lost generation or major educational deficits. As you grapple with these issues, the, the UWI stands ready to provide any technical or any other assistance that is required as we have developed quite a bit of experience and competence in this area. As you deliberate, you know, we are also grappling with a rapidly evolving world. We are almost fully into a digital age. Artificial intelligence is upon us. And our education system needs to pivot quite rapidly to produce citizens who are capable of competing, thriving in this new digital age. Again, these are major policy issues that the education system must grapple 
as the skills, competencies, and outlook needed for competing in a digital age are in many ways different from those of prior eras where a person with where skill rather than sometimes specific knowledge and skills or rote learning becomes less relevant and creativity, problem solving, adaptability, and also the softer skills that are often neglected in the education system become more important and our systems need to make these pivots quite rapidly. Especially in our Caribbean area, we confront the challenges of climate change and, non and chronic non-communicable diseases. While these impact all societies, their impact is especially acute in our sub-region. And I think the education system has a critical role in developing citizens who are critically aware of these issues and are able to make the choices and engage in the advocacy needed if the region is to get through and really manage these two major threats, you know, the existential threat of climate change and sustainability and the challenge of chronic non-communicable diseases. The opening ceremony saw cultural presentations from local groups and a showcase of the work being done within the education ministry here. The meeting will culminate tomorrow at the NIS conference room with a virtual press conference, which is scheduled for 1 p.m. Reporting for the API, I am Sheridan Lewis. When we return, we'll be dining in fine style. Stay with us. Tourism has many benefits to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It creates growth and a boost in economic activities, infrastructure development, job creation, entrepreneurship, and is a source of foreign exchange earnings. Supermarkets and vendors, bars, restaurants, taxis, tour guides, hotels, service providers, and many more all benefit directly from income gained through the tourism industry. Taxes collected from visitors to our country help St. Vincent's economy and its growth. Tourism is everyone's business. Live it, love it, embrace it. Tourism is everyone's business. Yeah. Live it, love it, embrace it. The hospitality industry here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is beaming with talented individuals, some of which began their career journeys at the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College Division of Technical and Vocational Education with its bar operations and food preparations programs. On Monday, February 14th, second year hospitality students were tasked with preparing and serving a first class meal within a restaurant type setting. The API's Bavin Oliver was there and filed this report. Imagine a kitchen filled with chefs using excellent ingredients to prepare aesthetically pleasing yet delicious meals. Imagine a beautifully arranged dining area with servers who gracefully take your order with a smile. At first glance, one would think this is a scene from a five-star restaurant filled with Michelin star chefs with world-class waiters. It may come as a surprise to know that these are students from the SVG Community College Division of Technical Vocation Education. The students were engaged in their final assessment, putting what they learned throughout their respective courses to use as they prepared a three-course Valentine's Day lunch for the hospitality staff. We begin in the kitchen where we met with lecturer of the SVG Community College Division of Technical Vocation Education, Edson Davis, who told us what was on the menu and exactly what is taught and how they are able to foster creativity among students. Well, today we are going to do something for us, our hospitality staff, seeing today's Valentine's, so I'm teaming up, teaming up with Mrs. Combatch service group. So we're going to do a scrumptious meal, three course meal, which consists of an entree, an appetizer and a dessert. For the entree, they're going to have a grilled barracuda with uh, mango salsa, um, garlic herb butter and so on and so forth right also sweet potato mash um, for the appetizers we're going to have a carrot ginger soup just with a slight hint of ginger also a spring roll right with a sweet and sour garlic sauce and for the dessert we will top it off with a panna cotta well yes we everything here is about standards I mean standards is what run in the hospitality department in the, I should say the hospitality industry with standards, it goes along where you have to practice safety, sanitation and hygiene. There's a way in which you plate and so on and so forth. So therefore, that the standards have to be up, kept 
And standards is one thing that we taught, teach here very strongly at our institution. Um, for instance, I teach baking technology one and we're doing bread. So I ask the students, um, anybody in here would have done bread before? Yes, sir. So tell me how you do bread. So they say they way out, they send the way out, that and so on and so forth. But they don't know there are 12 steps in bread making. 12 long steps in bread making. So that is one thing that the students don't know about. So persons, as you quietly say, that persons come in here with a background from their home and where they, where they would have went before, but there are, couple, there are a couple more things that you need to learn here when you come. Things like um, blanching. So you blanch your food, you have to shock them. What is shocking to slow down the process of cooking so that it will get a crunch. So it will be the word al dente. You know, so things like that they don't know. So that is why we are here to teach them about these things. I, I always tell my students that we are competing against each, um, each other. I mean, there are persons out there that went and get more training that they had. But what we do here, we strive for excellence. And what we do, we ensure that we train them in a specific way. So when they go out there, they will be marketable, right? And even if they don't have a, a, um, employment, they can gain employment from themselves. For instance, they can do bread and sell in the community. That is a way, a way to start. They could also do um, kind of cutters and, and so on and so forth. So we try to make a whole holistic way of them, not by just entering the workforce, but also gaining employment for themselves. For example, today we are doing a, gin, we are doing a carrot soup, right? There's a recipe, yes, but we're going to put a hint of ginger to it. So that is a creativity. There's also creativity in plating because, you know, people eat with their eyes. So once you have a, a technique and a creative way in plating, you could just wow the guests. I always tell my students, ensure that the food tastes good and ensure that they play good. But think outside of the box. That is one thing we teach them as well, thinking outside of the box. You know, so come up with creative ideas and, and creative things. They could even say, come up with their own recipes and things like that. Um, and I always tell them that everything is, you have to try everything. Not even the recipes that we have, it's just a guide. But you have to play with it and practice to, to be creative and to come up with your own. Actually, um, we have four programs running. We have the food and beverage management. This is the first year that food and beverage management has been taught. And embedded in this course, we have food preparation one, food preparation two, and also quantity food production. So what we do, we, we try to mark, we try to mold the students because we never know where they may end up, right? We never know where they may end up in the world. So yes, we train them enough so that they could go out there and be competitive. Also, the influx of students every year is so much that we do use to have room for some of them. You know, because I, I, the hospitality department to say is very, very overwhelmed with students because everybody wants to come and to learn a skill in the hospitality, which in the hospitality industry, which is a fast growing industry right now. What happens is that we, we, we tell them to, to look, right? To look beyond and to look to see what's current right look to see what's current so we will look at a a fish and we would like to see what's trending now what can we do with this fish what can be done with this for example today in our plating we are going to use a planting chip and i saw one of your guys hit one as well, uh, just now we're going to use a planting chip to to garnish our plate right i wish you guys would have been here to see that so you know we have to keep up with the trends and to make sure that what happened last the, the food that happened last year or year before, we're going to try and bring it current. What, what can we do with it? Let us play with our food and, and see what could be done now. We moved to the dining area where the students engaged in bar operations created a spectacular restaurant scene. We met another lecturer, Michelle Kamenbach, who highlighted what the students learned as part of the bar operations course. Hospitality, year two students, they'll be doing the service part of it. So they'll be serving food as well as drinks. And we're working with another group of students who, who are a food and beverage management student who will do the cooking of the food. Yes, uh, basically what they learn from the course, you know, there are techniques like, for example, serving wine and serving food where you should serve it from right or left and different courses of the meal from appetizer up to dessert and stuff like that, yes. Um, the students are actually taught uh, international standards of service and even um, different classic cocktails that are known around the world. So they would definitely, I was, 
a restaurant manager. I was in the, I've been in this business for the, over 25 years and I'm 100% sure that this will be very useful for them. You know, things things like um, how to how to manage basically how to manage a bar in a restaurant. So um, even if, if something go wrong, they are taught how to handle those type of things. Um, there are standards that they have to follow, which are being practiced internationally, not just in St. Vincent. The food rival that of many top restaurants, with the service creating a comfortable yet enjoyable dining experience. Two students of each course shared what inspired them to enroll and where they see themselves in the future. My name is Ryan Elaine. I'm a second year hospitality student and basically today we're doing a pre well, practical event where we're displaying our skills that our teacher, Ms. Kamabach, taught us and also other teachers and showing our appreciation for the teachers today. Basically my love for serving persons, I love to make sure persons have a great meal, make sure they're satisfied at the end of the day, they have, could come back and say, oh well I love that server, you know she served us well. It, well, in the course, um, bar management, I basically learned how to pair wines with meals and also some mixtures. I now have a favorite drink, which is the margarita. My name is Asante Nichols and I am part of the hospitality program as well. Um, today, this is basically a practical where, as Royani said, we're, we're portraying our skills that we were taught. Um, what is unique about the program is that you get to work. You get to work in different places. You get to, you get to convert your skills and show other people what you have to offer to them. Um, what hospitality by operation has taught me is how to be open because I suffer from panic attacks really badly and how I'm really calm now, it has molded me to be this way. I love people. I love making people happy. I love offering them the best service there is. And yes, that's what I love doing. Good morning, my name is Akila Rind. And this morning, I am preparing a ginger and carrot soup with some chicken spring rolls and a, a sauce, a kind of specialty sauce by myself as well. Okay, so as we minorites, growing up, we know most children would grow up on cartoon and stuff. Well, that wasn't the situation for myself. I grew up watching cooking shows. I am inspired by Gordon Ramsay. From a tender age, I would be around the kitchen seeing what, what is done, how is, it, how is it to be done, etc. Yeah, so it's just me, it's just, I have a passion for this. This is what I love to do. Well, I am currently enrolling the food and beverage management program, not culinary arts. So I'm, I would like to go into the culinary arts and get a feel of, well, the food and beverage is dealing with everything because we mix drinks also, we do um, the service, etc. So we are getting a feel of everything. Right, I would like to go in the culinary arts program. Are we? Yes, please. Okay, and for them, that you, you want to get into managing a restaurant or being in the kitchen? Itself? Being in the kitchen itself. My name is Shadina Johnson. I'm from Countryside, Georgetown. Well, first off, I love cooking and I wanted to get more knowledge on the concept. To be honest, it's very hard because my first choice was architecture, so I don't know if I might be in between. In the next five years, I might be studying for that course or I'll be continuing this path, so I'm not sure as yet. Yes, because in a way, I can build my own restaurant, restructure it, do the foundation and everything. And I can be a part of the, the restaurant itself because I can do the restaurant and I could be a part of it, like the man manage it. So yeah, I think so. Reporting for the API, I am Bavin Olver. As we battle the unseen enemy, COVID-19, remember to be kind to each other, be a good neighbor, help someone less fortunate than yourself, be your brother's keeper. Together, we can overcome COVID-19. 
a message by the National Reconciliation Advisory Committee. Welcome back to IN Government. Operations of an airport encompass many detailed and precise processes that ensure a traveler's experience runs as smooth as possible. From airport customer service to gateway operations and aircraft maintenance, all functions must be conducted to the highest standards. Let's delve more into the exciting and dynamic field of aviation with the API's Yinka Chambers. Aircraft maintenance is one of the most important activities that aircraft airlines and owners should maintain and never underestimate. This is a set of activities that includes the inspection, reformation and repair of an aircraft, not only for large planes but for smaller aircrafts as well. The rules in aircraft manuals set the standard for maintaining your aircraft in order to uphold compliance. No airline or company is exempt when it comes to this. Aircraft maintenance is highly regulated in every part of the world due to, but not limited to, avoiding lost flights because of failure, maintaining good performance, ensuring passenger safety, and extending the life of the aircraft. Touring this integral part of the Argyle International Airport, the API sat down with aviator Jonathan Palmer, who explained how moving from Annisville to Argyle improved the overall functioning of operations in the maintenance department. The um, transition from E.T. Joshua was welcome and overdue. So being able to establish a um, first-class maintenance facility here was uh, fantastic and um, we welcomed it. The move w was a little difficult because of the deadlines. Um, we had to be here on February the 14th, 2017 by midday because E.T. Joshua was being closed at that time. Yeah, so we had the transition had to take place um, because they used the same designator here as they did at ET Joshua, which was Sierra Victor Delta. This, yeah, and it couldn't be used at both airports. So we had to have everything in place because we were maintaining approximately 14 airplanes, locally registered airplanes, Vincentian registered airplanes at ET Joshua. So we had to do move them all at a specific time. And it was very difficult because we had to get certification for the hangar as well to be able to maintain those airplanes. So it was um, a challenge, but it was welcome, and uh, we're very happy about it. We had challenges at ET Joshua. We had severe challenges, you know, with the flooding, the restrictions, the tail would take off, and it was um, very difficult to operate out of there. So to come to Argyle was just so refreshing for us, and it was like a new beginning and um, it was just welcome. And then we could also diversify the business because we have the international carriers coming in and um, so our maintenance could uh, expand into other areas, um, like meeting the international carriers when they land here and you know, just looking after whatever um, issues that they might have so that they can be um, dispatched in a timely fashion and, and also with uh, safety in mind. Yeah. And um, you've been here for five years. Uh, a lot of persons didn't see this happening. Oh. <laughs> what do you say to that? Oh my goodness, that was, that was a difficult time. You know, when the airport um, was announced that it would uh, be taking place and um, that construction was to begin, it was difficult because being an aviator, I um, had analyzed the the winds and the environment carefully before making a decision. And we committed in 2011, right, when there was a lot of controversy, a lot of negativity, and there was a lot of pushback on the airport, but we saw um, no reason why we should not invest. Because the, we'd done the wind studies ourselves, um, and it was, for me, it was simple. It was um, a lot safer than operating out of E.D. Joshua. The, the crosswinds were not an issue. Um, so 
so it was an easy decision to invest here. And uh, we've been very happy since we moved here. Very, very happy indeed. I mean, we've, we've dealt with COVID uh, for a couple of years. The revenue um, and passenger numbers have been terrible. But you deal with those things. Yeah, and you know it's going to be for a protracted period, a short period, and you know, you come through it, you'll be battered and bruised, but you come out the other end, right? And you make the adjustments and then you move on from there because it will, it will um, improve. And we've seen Sandals investing here. We've seen um, the rainforest, the seafoods in Calicor. We've seen that come to fruition. We see the, um, the view, um, Royal Mill, it's, it's, it's all coming together. And I think it's fantastic. You know, it's really good for the nation and um, for the future of, of our country. The OECS maintenance manager explained his roles and the roles of the department as he gave the team a tour of the facilities at the AIA hangar. I'm Raymond Johnson, maintenance manager at AIA International. So I deal with all the internationals. This is OECS Aviation. We do maintenance for Musty Airways and SVG here. And we can also do other maintenance because we are a standalone AMO, the first one for the Eastern Guardian. Aircraft um, Approval Maintenance Organization. Okay. So now you, you learn something. Okay. So we maintain three different types. An island. Island. Britain now. Twin Island. commanders. Okay. Twin otter. So this is a twin otter aircraft made by the Avalon Canada. Yes. This is one of them that goes down that do shuttle through the islands and stuff and the Grenadine Air Alliance. Now we are doing what we call a popular change. So the guys are setting up to do it. So you have the stores, the supporting stores for the aircrafts, both sides. So that's musty area, that FDG air source. So it stores the, the aircraft parts, the control stores, the control. Raymond, did you ever in when you were at, uh, at E.T. Joshua? No. No? I didn't know no, Sendinson. So okay. I know Sendinson through Caribbean Airlines, where they used to, where they came here. Uh -huh. So we went, kind of a Wednesday to here. I don't like it. So you station here, you live here now? Yes. Okay. So how are you finding that? It is it is good. <laughs> Where did you move from? Um Trinidad. I was in Trinidad uh -huh. for nine years. And then I came here. My Caribbean. Yeah. And then this is the quality office. Um like the police for the organization keep us in line. And he's also a Johnson from Jamaica. Oh wow, <laughs> that's nice. The quality manager is the family of Johnson. <laughs> so inside here we have a, the combination of planning and records. He's in Paris, he's the supervisor of planning. And Aisha, Aisha, Aisha. This <laughs> is yeah. the records supervisor. This is where when we correct everything that these guys mess up all the time. <laughs> Not because, um, because what what happens is uh, although they are good at what they do in terms of fixing their plane. Aircraft is not deemed to be peer worthy. 
unless the paperwork is right. All right, so they do the physical work, they do the sign out. They, everything is reconciled here. And we also do the planning in terms of what they are to do at um, specific intervals. And you will know that um, aviation is highly regulated. And everything that we do, they must be done to a particular standard. And she ensured that all our technical data is current at all times to meet um, our regulatory um, obligations. She's quite efficient at what she does. In order to effectively take preventative measures, aircraft should undergo different levels of inspection through an aircraft maintenance schedule. For the API's Ion Government, I am Yinka Chambers. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers, working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help your kids read, learn, grow. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. So parents you play your part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org slash ELP. And finally this evening, investment opportunities abound in the blue economy. Sustainable livelihoods can be easily achieved once effective and efficient conservation measures are taken to preserve marine ecosystems. A new study to assess the conch and lobster population in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is currently being conducted to ensure that policymakers are guided when making significant decisions that will affect this important marine resource. The API's Inga Jackson tells us more in this report. Seafood plays an essential role in feeding the world's population, and without a doubt, St. Vincent and the Grenadines depends heavily on the food from the sea. As the government continues to tap into the blue economy, steps are being made to preserve our marine resources. Such step is the baseline assessment study, which will be conducted by the Blue Marine Foundation Project in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries and will be funded by the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Environment Fund. This study will be conducted over a three-week period and would see local fisher folks and divers being trained. Speaking at a modest launching ceremony, Senior Fisheries Officer Chris Isaacs highlighted the benefits of blue economy here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and other Caribbean islands, and the importance of the baseline assessment project, especially to conch and lobster divers. The World Bank report in 2015 stated the average annual losses by OECS countries from extreme weather events in the period of 1993 to 2012 range from about 1% here in St. Vincent and Grenadines to 9% in Grenada. Yet, the ocean and coastal space provides a unique comparative advantage to unlock the contribution of the marine-based assets to employ and raise GDP growth. Such an approach is uh, coined as the blue economy and seeks to promote not only economic growth but also social inclusion and looks at the improvement of livelihoods while at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability of our oceans, seas and coastal spaces. 
the blue economy can include a range of sectors, obviously fisheries, but we can also look at tourism, transportation, and even renewable energy, all of which represent an opportunity to derive greater value from traditional sectors and create new value through technology, technological and social innovation, all the while improving on environmental sustainability. Now, the extensive area of our marine and coastal space and, of course, associated living and non-living marine resources presents numerous opportunities for us here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to not only bolster our economy, but also to begin recovery from our COVID-19 pandemic that has been going on, as well as our volcanic eruption that took place last year, April. It is, however, important that we protect our vulnerable resources as we leverage their economic value in a sustainable way. The opportunity that is provided to us here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines by the Blue Marine Foundation and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Environmental Fund is a chance to learn more about the general population that's out there for marine resources, their health, and the biodiversity in general. With this research, the Fisheries Division, and by extent the Ministry of Agriculture, will be provided with data that our management plans can use to ensure the conch and lobster fisheries operate at a sustainable level, allowing stocks to regenerate thus protecting local livelihoods not only for now, but for future generations. Senior Project Manager of Blue Marines Foundation, Dr. Judith Brown, would be leading the training and research team during the project. At the project launching, Dr. Brown gave the audience a breakdown of how her team will conduct the research process. One of the most important things that we'll be doing is um, engaging with stakeholders and the local community. So in particular with the fisheries department, um, as I've mentioned, they've got a huge amount of knowledge and experience that is really important, but also with the local fishing community um, and anyone really involved within the fishing industry, for them to tell us um, where they see the opportunities, where they see the challenges. Um, a lot of fishers are always a great source of information because they remember what it was like 10 and 20 years ago. And even that anecdotal evidence provides great insight into the changes in your fishery and where things are progressing or could progress in the future. So um, what are we going to be doing? So we're going to be doing some dive surveys around Union Island. Um, and that's starting from tomorrow. Um, and this is going to be some conch surveys to look at the abundance and the population, so the numbers and the size distributions of the conch around the island. Now it's great because there was actually a survey in 2013 which really looked at the conch populations then. So we're going to have that comparison of data so we can see have the numbers increased, have they decreased? Like Louise mentioned, the divers are reporting, have they moved into deeper waters? Are we finding more adults or more juveniles? And this is all really important information that feeds into your assessment of the fishery and of the stocks. Um, and it's great because Chris was on that survey, so we will definitely be um, picking his brains quite a lot. We're going to move that survey and then do a week of conch surveys, conch and lobster surveys around Beckway. Um, this is great because this means that we can then have the comparison in the catches around Beckway to Union and then also again against that historical time series around Union. So we'll be travelling as much around the island and as many survey sites as we can get in with um, advice and feed in from the local conch fishermen because again they have the knowledge of where to go and where to do the surveys so it'll be great to have them on board and they're going to be joining us um, as part of the dive team. Um, and we will also be doing a few areas in the Beckway Reef systems and that is going to be looking at the abundance of the fish, the numbers of the fish and the different diversity of fish species in those reef habitats. Looking at the health status of the reef but also looking at the sort of commercially important species, so your pa the ones that people take to eat, your, your groupers, your snappers and things like that. Um, and then there's a couple of areas around St Vincent that we're going to be focusing on. Um, this is the South Coast Marine Park where we've actually been fortunate enough to be in the water already so far and I am blown away by the size of your barrel sponges. That's uh, been really phenomenal to see. Um, but there's also a really great diversity of um, fish that we've seen so far and a good abundance of quite a lot of juveniles, which is also really nice to see. 
especially juvenile parrotfish. Um, so it's too early to say we've only done a few dives, but that could be a really nice sign um, of the ban that the minister had has passed through actually starting to have some impact on the reefs which is and um, parrotfish are a really important species for your reef health so hopefully that's a good sign and we can look at that obviously once we've got more data and then this is a proposed leeward coast marine protected area and we've started to do the surveys up along the shore in the reef habitats but we're not just focusing on the reefs so for every time we do a dive we're actually doing two surveys one within the reef habitat and one within the seagrass habitat nearby. And that's because they both have different functions and are both really, really important. Um, seagrass are critical for juvenile fish, but also I'm sure a lot of you heard about the, their importance in drawing carbon and therefore um, protection against climate change. And potentially, you know, if it's a, it's a growing field, it may be an area to grow, get money for protection through carbon credits, a bit like they have carbon credits for trees on the land. It's an area that's being investigated more and more and starting to become a real potential for bringing revenue into places for protecting those important areas. Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries Honorable Saboto Caesar expressed his gratitude to the Blue Marine Foundation for partnering with the ministry and said that many families, particularly those who are involved in the fisheries sector, will benefit greatly from the baseline assessment study. We decided to establish a public-private partnership for all of the landside facilities in Oya. In Kialiakwa, Kingstown, Barley, and Chateaubillet has come on to the table, Bekwe, Kanawan, and Union Island. I want to thank and to congratulate all the investors who have partnered with us over the years. And we have seen in the statistics the exponential growth that we are currently experiencing. And when you look at the livelihoods of many of the communities involved in fishing, they will tell you that even though they are in the middle of a pandemic, that they are not seeing significant declines in their income streams. We have a total ban on the capturing of turtles. We have a ban on the taking of the parrot fish. Approximately two weeks ago, I took a document to the cabinet and it was approved where we now have a maximum size limit being placed on the taking of lobsters. So there's a minimum size and a maximum size. And this has been recognized as a best practice by the CRFM. And uh, there's a letter to that effect that I, I will share with the, the media at some point. We are working on several protected areas, coral restoration, and very soon you're going to hear a big announcement that we have signed on as a country to the 30 by 30 target, where we are going to support the protection of a large percentage of the global biodiversity by 2030. The technicians are doing excellent work in monitoring, and I am going to ensure that with the growth that we are seeing in, in the fisheries, that you receive more staff members to ensure that when you leave an excellent guide for us, we can have people to monitor as we go forward. We are completing our work on the draft fisheries bill. In fact, the, the cabinet has granted approval for the consultations to take place, and that will begin very soon. I want to encourage the young people who are listening not to shy away from the value chain being created in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in fisheries. The baseline assessment study was launched on Monday, 14 February at the Beachcombers Conference Room. For the API, I am Inga Jackson. Thanks for joining us. That's all we have for this edition of Iron Government by the Agency for Public Information. If you missed any of our programs and want to catch up, 
please visit us on our social media platforms. Do join us again on Saturday for Inside Story. I'm Hala John. Have a wonderful evening.